Good. So welcome everyone. Uh, Jarrett, Samantha, and I are happy to have you join us while we discuss how you can optimize your income as a new business owner and professional. Sometimes a new life, a new business owner, um, as a new business owner, life can feel a little bit confusing and maybe overwhelming. You're likely asking some questions um, like, what can I do to optimize my income? How can I potentially reduce my tax burden? And a big one, which we will talk about today is, you know, should I incorporate? And if so, when does that make sense to do so? And what does that mean for my business? So incorporating can be a big change to the business structure. And as you will hear today, it's not something that you want to do lightly. Now, it doesn't have to be scary. Um, there are just a, some, a few things that you'll need to consider first because um, it is hard to go back on. So it is the business structure with the highest setup costs and administrative costs. Um, there's a lot more admin work that's required to, for a corporation. And it's also the most complicated business structure. So it, it's, it's important to take extreme care in setting it up and doing it ideally with a professional um, to advise you on how to do it. Professional can really help you with the two sides of incorporating. You know, it doesn't make sense on paper. Um, but also does it make sense to your life and what's going on there? You want your business to be in a very stable like spot. You don't really want to have a lot of big life changes or time off coming up. Um, so things like a maternity or paternity leave. You know, if you're renting right now uh, an apartment for $1,200 a month, but you're planning on moving into a new house, that will be significantly more costly than that. Those are all the things that um, someone can help, can help you consider when you're making the decision. It is going to impact your business in a number of ways, and we will address them today. So at this point, I'm going to pass it along to Samantha. All right. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. So a lot of the times when we're talking to our clients, we find them asking themselves, you know, why should I incorporate? Are there drawbacks to incorporating? And once I make that cross into, you know, no longer just being a self-employed business owner, but actually having a corporation, what are my next steps? What do I need to figure out? And let's say the stars aren't aligning and it isn't the right time for you. What other type of tax planning can you do um, to help with that, uh, you know, uh, income optimization and making sure that you're not just, you know, putting all of your profits to the CRA? So we're going to touch on a lot of these things today, but some of the big red flags that it's time to incorporate, even if some of the other um, little nuances aren't lining up, is if you really have a need to limit your personal liability, that can be one of the things that pushes you to incorporate. Maybe when on paper, it's still not going to have huge tax savings, but you really do need to limit that personal liability. That's kind of one of the more obvious signs. Another thing is if you're in a type of industry where you need to remain competitive, um, if you're making bids on projects and stuff like that, sometimes there are companies that just simply will not work with you if you're not incorporated for a variety of reasons. So if you're in an industry where you're kind of being limited as in terms of how much you can grow because you're not able to stay competitive in that way, it might push you to be needing to incorporate a little bit earlier. So the less obvious rules of thumb, and, and everybody will always joke that this is my favorite picture to put on the screen, but, but I think that this woman is what I'm striving to be in life. But some of the less obvious rules of thumb is if you're making more money than you need to live off of, um, and you feel kind of like this fabulous woman here, chances are you're, you're ready to, to breach the step into incorporation. Your tax savings are probably going to be more than what you're going to be facing in terms of the increased administration tax and legal fees that Michelle kind of alluded to earlier. Again, this is not necessarily when you're first starting your business and you're living super modestly, like you're, you know, you're living off of um, like ramen noodles and penny pinching because you want your business to be successful. And you're like, oh yeah, I have more money than I need to live off of. This is when you're fairly stable you can predict your business is going to stay fairly stable and you're living a lifestyle that is sustainable and you still on top of that have too much money. So those are kind of the big things where you should start really considering incorporation. And on the personal sides of things, your, your financial planning might look something like this, might look like, you know, you're, you're planning for major purchases, you're planning your cash flow, you're planning your insurance. Your tax is going to, like how much tax you're paying is going to play a lot into that because it determines how much money you have left at the end of the day to meet all of these other needs. Um, we have to keep in mind that it is a big portion of your ability to financial plan. And so reducing our tax burden can increase and optimize our income in that way. So aside from, you know, the big red flag reasons we talked about, Deferring tax and optimizing your income is typically the reason that people do end up incorporating. 
So what are some of the highlights of that? Obviously tax deferral, um, a corporation is going to have an unlimited lifespan, easier access to financing, um, just happens to be the businesses are a little bit higher, uh, easier to finance than people. Um, it's also going to give you access to the small business tax deduction and capital gains exemption. So let's take a look at an example because I think none of this really makes sense without looking at an example. So let's say that you have a gross income from your business of $215,000 and you, you take a look at your lifestyle and you say, you know, I need about $60,000 annually to live off of after tax. That's the money that I need in my pocket, about $5,000 a month. Okay, well, that's $80,000 approximately before tax and we have some business expenses. Those are going to go up when you incorporate. You're going to have higher legal fees, higher accounting fees, stuff like that. So just to be on the fairly conservative side, let's say that your expenses are going to go up by about $5,000 a year when you do incorporate. You also have that um, salary that you're going to be paying yourself of $80,000 out of the corporation before tax. Now this chart has um, a breakdown of what that might look like for you. Um, so net personal income, if you aren't incorporated after you pay your expenses, that 215 becomes 178 after expenses of 37,000. You're paying about 62,000 in tax and you're left with 115 at the end of the day. Mm. It's not bad. Um, if you incorporated, however, and you paid yourself $80,000, and your corporation had 93 left after paying you a salary and after paying all of those $37,000 of expenses plus the increased expenses associated with being incorporated. The corporation pays some tax. You also pay tax personally, but not nearly as high because you're only being taxed on that 80,000. After tax, you're now left with about $137,000. So the difference between those two numbers is quite staggering. Right? And so this person might look at the example and say, wow, like, why wouldn't I incorporate? It makes so much sense to me. And it does. Again, we would go back to what Michelle mentioned at the beginning. Do you have any big life changes coming up? But this person says, well, you know, I just got married. I'm going to start having babies and I'm going to like work at 20% capacity for the next three years. That doesn't make any sense to incorporate. Perhaps we'd have to look at the numbers. Um, or if they're, they're planning big structural changes to their business. But on paper, this is making a lot of sense. On the flip side, let's say if we look at the similar example, but the business isn't bringing in as much. Okay, the business is only bringing in 125. Um, they're still ramping up in, in whatever capacity they're working in, but the expenses are still the same. Obviously, the bottom line here is that you're pretty much the same whether you're incorporated or not. And so in this situation, it might not be time. It might not be time to cross that threshold. But maybe if you have some of those red flags, like you want to limit your liability or you want to be more competitive so you can earn more than 125 a year in some of those industries, it might make sense for you to look at incorporation or at least say, hey, I'm pretty close to the tipping point where it's going to make more sense. This is something that I need to start thinking about. This is something that I need to keep in mind for myself because, you know, who knows when you're going to earn more income and need to start uh, changing things up. Our, our financial plans are never, never static. So what are the drawbacks? Um, obviously, Michelle mentioned the initial cost, um, the, initial, the initial setup and annual administration. It's paperwork. It's like anything, like setting up a business, there's always going to be paperwork. Um, you also can't realize losses in a corporation, so that is um, a potential drawback as well. But hopefully, if you are looking at incorporation, you're, you're in a position where your business is, again, fairly stable and not going to face those things. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it off to Jarrett, and he can walk us through a little bit more about what things might look like once you do go down that lovely path. Once you incorporate, um, it's it's really actually quite simple to incorporate a business. You can go online, do it very inexpensive. Uh, that's not everything though. So you need to keep in mind that there's a couple steps you need to take afterwards. Uh, one big one is setting up, uh, formally addressing your shareholders, your directors, uh, and your officers of the business. Um, this is a requirement and you need to maintain this. This goes into your minute books, which need to be maintained annually. Even if you're the only one, it still needs to be done, right? So it's your business, you're the one running it, everything like that. 
it is required typically for any lending. So if you need to get a corporate mortgage, corporate line of credit, anything along those lines, uh, you, you need to have this established. And then if you ever do want to sell or bring on a partner, you need this so that they know what they're actually buying into and who who's actually part of this plan. So this is part of the administration and part of the things that it actually can get overlooked because it uh, people don't know that they need it. Uh, the other thing to consider, if you are still working a side business, um, if you are still doing something, uh, or st still working in, in an employee situation, you need to make sure you're taxing yourself appropriately, right? The example is if you're earning $40,000 uh, at your day job and then $40,000 from your, corporate, your corporation, uh, you're only being taxed 20% of each and really you need to be taxed uh, at a higher level. So not a huge deal, really. Just understand that you're going to probably owe money at tax time. Or if you would rather not, you can actually tax yourself higher before then. It's really up to you. It's just be prepared for it. So now on to salary structure. And this is probably where I think a lot of people think um, think about when they do a corporation and where they think they can save money and they, they think that, yeah, I'm not going to take salary. I'm only going to take dividends. It's you get more money that way. That's not really true. Uh, things are taxed pretty close. Salary is tax deductible to the business. So your business isn't paying any tax. You get fully taxed on it as an individual. Dividends are taxed in that business. Uh, first, it's after tax income. Yes, it's at a lower rate than personal salary. However, when it pays to you, you also get taxed again at a lower rate than just salary, but you add those two together, you kind of come out fairly close to the same amount of money and it's intended to be that way, right? It's structured to do that. But there's other considerations here. So it's not just tax savings. Um, paying yourself a salary, what it's gonna give you is, it's gonna increase your RRSP room, it's going to increase your CPP benefit because you do have CPP deductions coming off of it. Um, so basically looking at retirement options right there. It's also a lot better for your personal lending, right? If you do need to qualify for a mortgage or anything along those lines, salary is, is viewed more favorably. Uh, so consider that if that's ever going to be coming up for you. And then the other thing that's not based on corporate profit, right? Dividends are, are after profit. So salary is a bit more guaranteed that way. Um, the benefit of dividends, uh, you do have uh, no CPP uh, that you have to pay as employer or employee, employee. This, again, I brought it up as salary. It's a good thing. It's also a good thing in dividends. It really depends on your view. Uh, CPP is a great program where it's guaranteed income for life. Um, if you believe that will be guaranteed income for life and you want that security, great. Some people don't really trust it as much. So it's not as big of a, an advantage there. Uh, and then the timing flexibility with dividends. You can, um, you can pull it out. You can kind of declare a dividend when you kind of need to and not when you don't need to. Uh, so that's a big, big thing to consider. Uh, and then if you do have a partner in the business and if you're not really doing equal work, then you really need to structure this appropriately, right? You need to pay yourself for the work that you're doing, you and your partner are doing and make sure that those make sense. And then dividends are coming from your corporate profit. And that's more about owning the business. So that's the big breakdown of dividend salary. It's, it's individual, but these are things to consider. Uh, now, typically if you have dividends, you, it means that you have after tax profit. And if you don't need to take all that money then you need to start thinking about reinvesting in your business. Uh, I'm not gonna dive too deep into this. Next week, uh, the presentation will be a bit more focused on, on the complexities as you gain earnings and have higher retained earnings in your business. But uh, understand that by leaving money in the business, you don't need to leave it there and not have it earn anything. You can invest these assets uh, to help build up the value in there. And then again, that can eventually be paid out to yourself in different forms or just increase the value of your business. And then the other thing, it's not a requirement, but it should be almost a requirement, are shareholder agreements, okay? Uh, if you do have partners, uh, you should always set up a shareholder agreement. 
And this is going to establish basic rules of, of selling shares, buying shares, issuing shares, as well as what happens if one partner uh, were to be disabled and not be able to contribute to the business permanently, or if they were to pass away. How does the ownership change? And this brings in the insurance side of things as well, right? Ensuring that you have the capital required to buy the other half out, and then also make sure that the valuation of the business continues to adjust with the growth and the insurance follows that as well. So two very important things to make sure it keeps up as the business grows. Like I said, not a requirement, but you know, it's almost one of the first things I ask people when, when I talk to business partners is has this been done? Uh, so then moving on a couple um, things to consider whether you're incorporating or not is going to be uh, really your tax deductions, credits, all those things. Uh, really tax deductions are a great way to, to lower your income and lower your, uh, your tax out. However, you need to be careful. You need to make sure that you deduct the right things and that they're appropriate. CRA will look at things and see if, if it makes sense. They will often focus on vehicle allowance to make sure that it is appropriate, but they'll also look at other things you might try to write off. Okay. Uh, I, an easy example, a real estate agent, a photographer, they can write off camera gear. Yes, that can happen. Uh, you know, myself, I need to get a nice headshot for myself for our website. I'm going to write off a $2,000 camera. Do I really need to do that? So that those are things that can be looked at unfavorably, right? It's, it's you know, everybody wants to purchase as much as they can with their business. Uh, it doesn't always work. So don't think that you can buy that CDU under your business because, uh, you know, you take a client out once a year and, and that's how you gain a client. Doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, and then the other key thing is whether you're self-employed or uh, incorporated is you might need to be paying quarterly tax installments. So it's not just going to be do your taxes at the end of the year and pay. You may, may be required uh, to pay quarterly and keep up with that. Uh, and then paying yourself. So RSP, TFSA, as a business owner, what's going to make most sense? Um, the, the advantage of the RSP is the fact that it's tax deductible. So if you're pulling money out, getting taxed on it, you get that tax back. TFSA, once you're incorporated, doesn't always make as much sense because you're investing after tax income. Uh, and and it, Again, so you're investing less money essentially. Because money that is left in a corporation is taxed at a lower rate, you have a higher amount of money to invest. So you're typically gonna focus more on an RRSP at that point. Not that a TFSA is a bad vehicle, it's just you gotta understand the advantages and disadvantages. The key thing here, there's no one spot to invest everything, okay? Uh, RRSP is a very stable, program, same with the TFSA. Uh, a lot of people want to leave as much in their corporation because again, it's more money. It's, it's, let's leave it there. The rules about how assets are taxed in a corporation, once they leave a corporation, your excess ability to um, different deductions, everything like that, really, they, they change more frequently than, than the rules around RRSP or TFSA. So don't put all your eggs in one basket. Basket is basically the, the rule, the, the lesson to take out of that. Uh, and really it depends on each situation, risk profile, right? Like how, how willing are you to take risk uh, and, and be adaptable to the changes that might be coming up. And with that, uh, I think that goes to Michelle. I'm just going to chime in with one thing before um, I think we're going to go into questions. Um, something that Jared said is you have to be really cognizant of how, like what you're writing off and make sure that's all above board. Um, something I always tell my clients is, especially if they have a really aggressive accountant that, that's truly trying to get their tax bill as low as possible, writing off a lot of their income, be a little bit wary of that, um, mostly because from the other side of planning, that doesn't always work out if you have zero income to show when you're qualifying for loans, or you have zero income to show when you go to qualify for disability insurance. For example, I have a client right now who 
Um, you know, she wants more disability insurance, but unfortunately, like her income on paper is essentially zero dollars a year. Um, and so she can't qualify more, but for more, but she truly, she truly needs it. Um, because a lot of the things she's writing off are maybe personal expenses that are, are being shown as business. Um, and then on the tax-free savings account side of things, another recommendation I'll always um kind of present to my clients when they're getting close to the stage where they're looking at if they should incorporate is a lot of accountants are going to discourage you from pulling money out of a corporation to fund your tax-free savings account to a significant extent. So if you don't have any money in a tax-free savings account and you go to incorporate, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pull like $70,000 out, for example, to do that. So sometimes when you're looking at, um, you know, does it make sense to incorporate, we always have to remember with tax-free savings account and um, retirement savings plans that we want to make sure we've utilized those as much as it makes sense to before incorporating, especially with the tax-free savings account, because it may not make sense to do so once you are incorporated. So often I'll say, you know, if you want to have like 60,000 already in a tax-free savings account before you incorporate or 70,000, then you can make the annual contributions. That's usually okay um, and looks fine on paper, but taking a whack load of money out to fund those things isn't typically in your best interest. Um, and we want you, when you go into retirement or as your financial plan evolves, we want you to make sure that you have places to pull from so that you're not just like, oh, all I have is an RSP. All my income in retirement is now taxable. Um, you know, looking at not just optimizing your income today, but optimizing your future income as well. So she's my two cents. <laughs> okay. That's great, Sam. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be a second part to this webinar for more established business owners next Thursday with Justine and Terry. Um, it'll be at the same time. So just reach out to us if you didn't get the registration info or you do want that uh, resent to you. We'd love to have you join us if it applies to you. Um, so we'll open it up for questions. If you'd like to stay on and ask something or to hear, um, if not, feel free to jump off. And we really appreciate you joining us today. I did have one question sent to me directly. Um, it says, with all of these things, what should we make sure to prioritize to ensure we stay on track with our financial goals, um, prioritizing paying debt, investing, paying ourselves? Um, so I'm happy to kind of take that question um, because it's sent to me directly. Um, so I would say it all depends on your personal feelings towards financial planning. Like that's kind of the first step if you're somebody who really dislikes having debt, then maybe you should prioritize paying your debt first. Um, if you're somebody who you don't care if you have $300,000 of debt because you're just, you know, happy that you're saving and happy that you're investing and taking advantage of the market, that may make sense to you. But, but typically, you know, no matter what we're doing, we want to automate as much of it as possible. So if you're planning on putting money into a tax-free savings account, maybe do that as a monthly deposit. If you're planning on putting money into an RRSP, like $20,000 a year, maybe have at least a thousand of it automated so you don't hit, you know, February 28th and you're saying, oh my God, I didn't put any money into my RSP this year and I don't actually have any money left over. I've spent it all um, because I didn't pay myself first. So I think automating as much as we can, especially as business owners, like you guys are busy. And the last thing that you're thinking about is typically putting money away for your RSP contribution. You usually are pretty good at putting money away for taxes, but the rest of it, you know, isn't as daunting or as important sometimes. So I think that that's a big thing. And um, having a plan, if you don't have a plan, none of it's going to happen. Making sure that plan works for you, though, is pretty important. Um, I have a lot of clients who will still incorporate, even if they have a lot of debt, because they're totally fine with that, but I wouldn't personally be fine with that. So we're all different. Um, and I think that we have to be very aware of those differences when we're um, prioritizing our goals. Good question. All right, any other questions before we wrap things up for the day? Feel free to email us to uh, the info at zavitzinsurance.com and we will be able to address you um, yeah. any questions you have after as well. Yeah, I do. Um, I seem to be getting a lot of direct messages. Oh. Um, so um, I'll address one direct message I got was, was that Peter's echoing Jarrett's comments about uh, seeking legal guidance when setting up the structure of the corporation. Um, and the post-incorporation documents. And honestly, yeah, Peter, I completely agree. I've, I've had clients who have um, 
incorporated themselves and it's not always the prettiest thing in the world. So definitely leaning on the advice of your, your financial team, um, which kind of leads into Kate's question, like what point do you require a financial planner? Um, Jarrett, do you want to comment on that? So I'm not just answering all the questions. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> uh, it, there's really no right or wrong time, right? Like the earlier you can get into it, uh, the better because you can, may not mean that you're going to be incorporating right away or making changes right away, but it can lay the, the roadmap, right? The groundwork. Uh, your first, if you're coming in early, it might be fairly simple, right? It might not be a ton, but it's like, okay, we're, we're going to prepare for ourselves for when things get more complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if it's later on, that's fine. It's just come in with all the information without all the information can't really give the best advice. Uh, and that's the biggest thing. So if you come in at a later point where you've done a lot on your own, you know, you set up your corporation, you, you might have been dealing with, again, doing it properly, setting up with, with the lawyer and getting all the, the legal documents done appropriately and have your accountant, but uh, you, you don't really know what to do with your money. Uh, that's still fine. Um, just come in with, with the information so we can give the proper advice. I guess the, the answer is really, it's never too early. It really isn't. Um, it's not really going to cost you any more in the long term. It's going to probably make you richer in the long term by by having a plan well ahead of time. Mm 